Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Haptics Club podcast. I'm Brian from SenseGlove and I'm joined by the Haptics crew, Manu from Unity, Ashley from Titan Haptics and Eric from Razer. The Haptics Club is a team of people that have a passion for haptics. Our goal is to raise awareness of the amazing tech and people in haptics and to foster interesting discussions on the subject. Want to learn more about haptics? Check out our blog at thehapticsclub.com slash blog or get some swag like a shirt or a mug at our store, thehapticsclub.com slash shop. Today, we've got a special guest, Philip Sachs, who is the COO at SealTech. Within the world of haptics, SealTech is known for Hapticore, a haptic feedback technology for rotary knobs. Before we jump into today's episode, we'd like to share you today's sponsor, Grebus. Grebus develops a wide range of acoustic sensors and haptic actuators for all types of industries and applications. Make sure to check them out, and thanks again for sponsoring today's episode. Then lastly, be sure to visit thehapticsclub.com and check out our latest blog post and peek into our upcoming guests. And that's it for the intro. Let's jump right in. Philip, thank you very much for being here today. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Brian. I'm very happy to join Haptics Club for today's episode. Doing very, very well after uh, an amazing trip to the US last week with lots of impressions, especially from GDC. It was a uh, great being there and uh, you now get to know new faces and also the latest trends in haptics. That's awesome. We're really eager to learn yeah, what you guys are up to, uh, who you are. So I thought maybe it's good to have a small introduction about who you are, Philip, and uh, what you're doing at SealTech. Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Philip Sachs. I'm Chief Operating Officer of SealTech. Um, I joined SealTech from the very first moment um, as I was uh, employee number one. Um, SealTech is a joint venture of Steva and Inventus, um, whereas Inventus is the creator of the technology of the uh, force feedback technology um, created with MR technologies. So we're using either magnetological fluids or magnetological powder, so which is basically carbonyluron powder. Um, before I joined Xealtech, I worked for Inventus as head of marketing and sales. Um, which was not just related to haptics, uh, but to real adaptive suspend, uh, suspensions and adaptive haptic devices for multiple applications. Um, before I joined Inventus, um, I was studying um, IT and business process management and strategic um, strategic, <laughs> strategics um, in Innsbruck and Liechtenstein. And then I did a master's in international marketing and sales, so I'm more on the business side. Um, but I have a pretty in-depth um, technological understanding of things. So when I joined Inventors, it was like, it was just blowing my mind when I touched uh, the in-touch, how we called the Hapticore before we created Xealtech. Um, because it just blew my mind. That was my first point of contact with haptics at all. And it was just, you know, like mind blowing that a knob could change its characteristics based on pure software. Um, because I just had, in a, like it was actually, um, when I had the first talk to inventors and the first talk to Stefan, when I just was so mind blown by haptics that I really wanted to make them big and this was then one of the reasons why we created Xealtech because we needed someone who industrialized the mass manufactured their products. That's, That's awesome. So it. maybe, awesome. Thank you very much. So maybe for people who are not familiar yet with the Hapticore, can you tell us a bit about what it is and maybe even more important, what it feels like when you're using it? Sure. Like uh, the Hapticore is um, the world's first uh, full adaptive rotary encoder. Um, we call it semi-active haptic actuator because what we are not doing is driving in, act, driving it actively, like you could do with a, a BLTC motor, for instance. Um, what we do is we are we have a really real-time adaptive braking device, which means we are using, as I mentioned before, magnetological technologies, uh, which are either magnetological fluids or pure carbonyluron powders. What you can think of, it's like dust. It's like metal dust, specially coated, um, which when exposed to magnetic field forms chains. Okay, 
So we have a rotor and a stator, and the stator house is, is housing a coil. And if you put current on the coil, we're generating electronic electric magnetic field, which we can modulate by defining the, the current. So we can make it stronger or lighter, and this, uh, this happens in real time. If we put a magnetic field, or if we generate the magnetic field, the carbonyl iron par, uh, particles are forming chains between the stator and the rotor. And this is creating friction. And as this happens within milliseconds, so our typical response times are anywhere between three to uh, six milliseconds from zero to 100, which we, zero is called off state and 100% current is called on state. And everything in between can be generated by modulating the current. Um, and this is how we can create haptics. So everything is possible between having a free spinning device um, or a fully locking device. So I have a small demo on my table and I will show it, show it to you. And I will try to describe um, how it feels and what is happening. Um, so let me just turn my camera around a bit. I hope you can see it clearly. So what you see here is uh, multiple haptic actuators from a scroll wheel which maybe Eric knows a bit about it, um, and different rotary encoders, which are now free turn freely turning without any kind of force feedback. So you, they're just spinning. What I can do is, for instance, I can pulse a current to the call um, every couple of degrees in a certain strength, which is, is, which is resulting in a tick behavior. So the knob now feels like a knob which does mechanical ticks. And what I can do with it, I can modulate the strength, the amount of ticks in real time. So now I have really soft ticks um, with a really short step, uh, stop in between. Or I can modulate a clockwise movement. So which means the knob turns free in the clockwise direction, but is fully locked in the counterclockwise, counterclockwise direction. Same as Sure, for sure possible in counterclockwise as well, or I can even lock the entire knob. So now it's completely locked, right? If you go further, you can create barriers, which is a plus minus 90 degrees lockout with a distinctive center position or anything in between. You can create speed adaptive modes, which means if you turn slow, you have a tick. And if you go fast, it's free spinning. And at the end, um, you can really just design also the shapes and the curves how a tick should feel like by just pulling or dragging the lines, um, modulate how many ticks you want and how strong they should be. At the end, that's the current curve, which you de define on how much current um, you are applying to the call in which kind of shape, like a sinus wave or a sh uh, short pulse. And this is then how you can at different haptic patterns. That's way different than what other uh, companies are doing or other um, other companies and industries within the haptics. And that's one of the beautiful things in haptics that haptics has so many faces, right? You have those vibrotactile companies, you have surface changing uh, companies, um, and for sure you have force feedback companies like Xiltech is. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Philip. So, uh, what I usually like to jump in for the area of expertise is really uh, is looking at the user experience, the human side of things, and most specifically is uh, which which is the problem, the key problem that your technology solves. So, our key problem is maybe a bit different from from others. It depends from industry to industry. So, if I look at medical, for instance, and this is typically a situation where we use haptic core in, for instance, um, yeah, safety critical devices, which means if you look into an emergency room, for instance, where you have to engage with uh, or where you are confronted with really stressy situations where you're um, putting inputs into machines where you don't pay attention to a screen, for instance, you're, if you have a respir uh, respirator, you're looking at a patient's chest. If you, for instance, adjusting the volume of air which is trans transported in the lungs through the machine. So what we do there is we're 
having haptic feedback changed adaptively to the situation and to the pay, uh, for instance to the patient itself which means even if you blindly operate the system um, you get some extreme points where it's getting dangerous because you're for instance putting too much pressure on the lungs for instance so which increases the safetyness of the operation this is one uh, one of the major aspects the other um, sorry uh, sorry the question usually here that comes up is that are you working with a research organization to prove your statement or this is about internal research? No, we're for sure like mostly we are B2B companies. So this means we're working together with the um, ODMs of these machines or the OEMs of the machines. And they usually, especially in this in these fields, they're working together with universities on user experience studies on how to increase uh, the safety in the especially in in these types of machines um on the other hand we have other other customers for in this, for instance in industrial and off highway where it's all about efficiency of the process so this means um creating a workflow on a machine for instance a cnc drilling machine we're driving or controlling the x and y axis of a machine uh, of a cnc machine um to increase the operational um efficiency of the of the machine itself um but again we are working together with the uh, most likely with or in most of the cases with the b2b companies who are then working with the um with you mostly universities on hmi studies thank you for sharing so as usual for haptics uh, uh, specifically the use case that you shared a normal knob uh, could do the job right um, a more a normal a customized, I mean, a normal job, no, yeah. it could do the job. So the question sometimes comes down to price and uh, value and how much the value is. So um, did you find some cases where it was actually cheaper using your technology compared to using normal mechanical technology or a situation where a normal mechanical system simply couldn't do it and uh, uh, to actually to solve the use case? Uh, both. which is for example a critical use case yeah both is true because on the one hand side if you have a adaptive programmable knob you can in many cases we can substitute many knobs by just one which is on the one hand side possible in simplifying the hmi um but you in general you need to look at the entire hmi concept and not just on a single knob um, if you want to replace one knob for another knob, um, which is capable of doing adaptive haptics, mostly the solution would be more expensive. If you can have, if you can tailor the entire HMI to the use case itself, and if you can tailor the haptics of the knob um, to uh, be capable of handling all the different tasks, um, usually this is where the price uh the price gets interesting on the other on the other side yes we had some um some points where the adaptive haptic technology especially if you're thinking for instance on smart devices on smart knobs with multiple layers so if you if you need for instance to have a push pull mechanism in there and changing the haptics when the knob is pushed and turned you know as there are encoders on the market they have the push and push to turn functionality, for instance, um, our technology can be cheaper. So if you have Understood. multiple layers uh, with different haptic feedbacks, this is a very good example for it. OK, so thanks for sharing. Regarding the, let's say, uh, this is a new technology, right? So this type of technology are uh, usual when you actually think about implementing them. The first question, one of the first questions in engineering is a lifetime, uh, lifespan, because for example, consumer electronics has, uh, you know, some requirements. It's a couple of years. Some customers, OEMs like us, tends to do to want to rate them for more, but usually that's the strange. But automotive is like it's at least five to ten years. And some other application, like if you would like uh, look at uh, aerospace, you're looking at 20, 30 years. So what's uh, What's the usual range? Uh, what what are you what 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 where does your technology shine? Yeah. So first of all, MRF technologies or MRM technologies are not that new. Sorry, can you please uh, explain what is MRM? Yeah, like magnetological materials. So we are com uh, we are combining magnetological fluids and magnetological powders into MRM. This is our word for the magnetic materials. 
they're not that new than they look like, to be honest, because, um, for instance, they're used in automotive suspensions for years. Um, there is a, for instance, Ferrari, Eric, uh, is using magnetological uh, suspensions in their cars, um, as well as some well-known uh, American brands. Like, uh, for instance, if you look at Ford Mustang, they're using adaptive suspensions, uh, which have MRF technologies in there, um, as well as, for instance, Audi in MagniRide. So this is, the technology itself is not new to the market. What is new is the adoption um, into um, rotary knobs. So this is what we did first. But in general, the technology is, for instance, also used in industrial uh, steel wire solutions. So there's an American company um, who uses this kind of technologies for controlling forklifts, for instance. So the technology itself, in uh, like from a proof of technology point of view, is not that new. Um, what it what does it mean in terms of uh, lifetime for our knobs? Our standard knob portfolio is rated for over a million rotations. Okay, so this means. The wear, the wear and tear of the technology itself is very well um, controlled. And even after a million rotations, the knob is not failing at all. It's just um, like with any other mechanical encoder, um, you have some wear during, during life. And what we do is, and this is especially true when we started the development, it's really, really, really hard to define um, the technology, the technology um, and the life cycle testing for, for the knobs. So it's new, you're doing it for the first time. Most of the first times are painful, to be honest, like it was true for us as well, because you need to define on the characteristics of the system over lifetime. So what we usually do is we have a, like a, a characteristics which need to be um, fulfilled when the part is new, and they need to be the very same after a million rotations. What you see, even after 1.5 million um, of rotations, the, the parts are not falling apart. But for instance, the off-state torque is getting lower and the on-state torque is getting lower too. So this means that the entire gap is shifted downwards a bit because the entire system is, like we call it, it drives itself like, you know, all their parts get, get a bit, um, yeah, like worn, this is causing a lower on state and a longer, lower off state. But in Thank general, she is yeah. <laughs> very well known. Um, we are producing our knobs to automotive standards. Our entire production is automotive certified. For sure, we have some knobs like uh, the scroll wheel, which is not rated at automotive standard. Wouldn't make sense to have the entire sensor board and everything rated on automotive standard if we use it in a com uh, consumer electronics uh, product. Uh, just would add costs, but in general, our processes, how we manufacture, are on automotive standard for each and every I, product. I can indeed imagine that uh, developing the product brings a lot of mechanical and engineering challenges with it. But as you mentioned, the technology has been around for some time already. Did introducing it and developing it specifically for haptics bring any new challenges to you? And how did you face those? Sure. It was actually, you know, in haptics, I think uh, it was really hard for us to spec out uh, the technical data um, at the very beginning because they're not really what you're looking for in terms of haptics when you feel it and touch it. So. What we saw, um, for instance, when we did the scroll wheel, um, Eric knows it very well. Um, we are we have one uh, one product with a uh, razor in mass production, which is the scroll, Hyper Scroll Pro wheel of the Naga V2 Pro. Um, it's a bit of a try and an error thing at the beginning because you really need to get the right base haptics, the right base torque, the right on state torque, um, and this comes with a price tag. So the spread between on and off state torque, especially in such an application, needs to be tailored to the application itself. And at the beginning, we thought it's really easy to spec out, um, the, uh, for instance, the on and off state torque, uh, which turns turned out to be uh, rather hard to get the right product done. And um, 
yeah, after lots of testing and lots of trying, um, we got it right. And especially if you look at the component, I have one of them here. They're really, really, really small. So to give you an idea, they're diameter 14 millimeters and they're about 20, uh, 25 millimeters long, um, which is really small. And you need to have the sealing package in there, the sensor in there, and the right amount of powder in this type, uh, in this case. I'm mentioning the coil right in, uh, also in order to have the battery life uh, not infringed by the scroll wheel um, at all. This is a, a very good example on how we did it in the first time and uh, especially or in, for the for the first product in consumer electronics. Uh, thanks for sharing, Philip. Uh, so you, we did talk about the lifetime. We did talk about uh, integration things and we talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, say user experience and items. So um, I have a fundamentally a couple of questions. First one is uh, your take. So we did so lately that Ravian proposed uh, a scroll wheel, um, interesting scroll wheel concept in the new RT. RT2, I think, I don't remember how it's called. Yep. Um, and uh, that's, however, has an active component, uh, which is pushing back, basically. And uh, the, so, first of all, what do you think about that for this type of, use, type of use case? Because it's a new, has never been shown before, but it definitely makes a lot of sense as you can navigate the menus directly from the, from the scroll wheel, so from the scroll wheel and from the steering wheel. And the second thing is that, um, is it possible for your technology to be coupled with an active component to enlarge its uh, uh, haptics capability? So I saw some of this prototype uh, at the prototype stage at CEA, I think uh, five to 10 years back with Magnetorological. But have you ever looked at, uh, let's say from a production standpoint, what are you looking at if it becomes too complex or is something that makes sense? So multiple questions, Eric. Every one of them are really good. Um, first of all, I saw the Rivian concept um, on YouTube and I loved it. Actually, I really loved it because I think haptics in uh, automotive does make sense and uh, especially adaptive haptic feedback in rotaries because what I'm really tired of is all the touch functionalities in the car because it, you're getting distracted all the time. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of the, uh, of the solution and I'm also a really big fan of the adaptive haptic solution, uh, solution Rivian choose. Um, one thing about the BLDC motor um, or active haptics, um, I like the haptic modes they have with the motors. They come with some trade-offs, um, which I personally don't really like. Um, so haptics tend to be bumpy and smooth. I, I'm rather on the thing mechanical side, so they're feeling truly mechanical. Um, but in general, I see the point. I tried multiple of those concepts. If you look, for instance, in the, uh, to the DJI um, drone controls for the professional cameras, they also tend to have the BLDC rotaries, which feel very good. The point is you don't have the sharp barriers. So whenever it comes to precision, a BLDC motor is too soft for my taste. Okay, so whenever you want to really have something uh, precise, the other point is uh, you're generating lots of heat and the haptics are not that performant um, and constant compared to a braking system. Um, nevertheless, we are looking into adaptive active haptic feedbacks uh, systems um, currently. It's actually already in development something new. Uh, I can't, sh can't share too many details, but um, I'm looking into... So I want to test it as soon as you have it. Uh, you can test it. You can be sure that you can test it. The point is, um, multimodality in, hapt uh, in haptic systems is a really big keyboard for us. So I think that the future of haptic technologies is to combine functionalities where it makes sense. So this means, yeah, we will have multimodal actuators. You can add active haptics to our uh, systems already. Um, that's possible. In most cases, um, it's price dependent, you know? Like a motor is costs money, um, adds costs. Um, what we are looking for is 
to combine our actuators with other uh, modalities like vibrotactile feedback, for instance, um, which does absolutely make sense in some use cases. But we really need to be aware that it does not make sense to don't add costs. Um, so this is my answer to your question. Yeah, we are looking into active feedback. Um, it can be, it could be multiple, multiple ways to do that. There are spring solutions where you have springs in the systems which are pushing you back, but there is also the uh, ability to add, for instance, Vibrotecta um, for achieving an active, an active input on on the device itself. But I'm you will just add it to the products where it really makes sense. I see. And I just wanted to ask that, Philip, for because I at home personally, I don't have any uh, adjustable rotary knobs that are haptic. So what what extra value can that fiber tactile element bring to uh, the knob that already is there from you guys? For instance, it could uh, it can simulate an action. So if you touch your knob and your knob requests you to push something to to do a push input and you're not doing it for a while, it could stimulate you by a slight vibration, for instance. Or it can match, uh, it can be an additional like warning input if you're exceeding any kind of limits. You know, you can do a barrier, but you could enhance the entire experience by a vibration signal. And as lots of uh, vibrotactile companies really know, the, you can create entire sensations by vibration. So you can even, if you look at some uh, some of the latest uh, concepts, especially for instance, also in chairs, you can even stimulate um, the heart rate by a adequate um, vibration. So I think this adds lots of benefits. Besides that, you could make uh, users uh, or you could access new levels of interaction if you add feedback from an existing integration, even if it's just blocking the menu you know like you cannot enter here you can have a push but you can have a vibration as well um which is pretty nice so we did some explorations here can't talk too much in detail because it's really really new but uh you can be uh you can be like very excited about what is coming up here I, I I tend to not be excited about haptics till I test it, so I will uh, I will curb <laughs> yeah. my expectations. Uh, so thanks a lot. I think this is a good passage to the future of haptics. You started to talk about a little bit of multimodality as what uh, you what you want to bring your company or this type of things. So usually in the future of haptics, we tend to ask uh, generally two questions. He said, where do you see your company in five years, or where would you like it to be from a haptic standpoint, and in general on the market, right? But I will see the, my microphone to Brian for you to lead this uh, this discussion. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, uh, Brian, I'm looking at you right now. Uh, where do I see uh, Xiltech in five years? We're making <laughs> our way ahead to be uh, we really want to be the industry leader in force feedback technologies. There is a couple of um, the other systems which are around. One of the predominant systems is, for instance, the Sony DualSense controller, um, which has a force feedback system in there based on a on a motor and a very complicated gearbox, which again tends to have some mechanical issues in the field. Um, but we really want to make our way to be the industry leader in uh, force feedback actuators. Uh, that's where we where we uh, where we want to go and where we will push. Um, this does mean we will come up with a very new generation of technology uh, rather soon um, at the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, where we will update the entire Hapticore portfolio to a, a new generation, which will be more a revolution than an evolution. This is what it's I can show. That sounds amazing. So that the, the vision that you guys have, maybe you can share something about that. Is that broader than just the rotary sensors? Oh yeah, it is broader than just the rotary sensors. Uh, I can talk, I really can't talk too much about that because we have some really amazing projects going on, but um, we will okay. have some, we will also add some, let me, let me say like some linear actuators to our portfolio. I love a bit of mystery. That's awesome. I was also wondering, so if you uh, 
let's say in the coming few years, uh, one, two, three, up to five years from now, if you look at the industry, uh, what are the specific places where you think we as designers and uh, hapticians should be looking out for you guys? What are the spaces that are going to excel the most with your technology around? So um, there will be definitely gaming. Um, we will definitely uh, uh, exceed our market share in uh, gaming devices. Um, not saying how and with whom, but um, you will see. So oh, let's, uh, let's maybe 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 some some guys, some listener doesn't know. So, but um, with Siltech is a collaborator we have with Razer. Let's just uh, put these things out. It was before me joining Razer, so I don't have any vested interest in this one. So basically, they, they we did release the Naga V2 Pro last year, which has a, a scroll wheel which you can uh, design the haptic feedback of the modes. So the Ticks, uh, you can customize them at your own, your own liking. And also the speed dependence of the ticks can be customized. And there is also some user controllable, uh, user controllable UI on this. So this is a, 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 a mouse, which is niche for us, a niche because it's an MMO mouse. Um, but it's still it's still a it's still a good price, a good product. It's a price, it's a premium product. And uh, but however, this has uh, uh, install based on the market, and we are happy about uh, uh, at least uh, the users are relatively happy about the the technology. So this is just to clarify a little bit what type of product Philips is is uh, mentioning and which type of uh, use case there are on the market. Sorry, Philips, I just wanted to clarify because maybe some no users worry. didn't know it. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, we're uh, so you will see some updates of the technology um, and some broadening there. Um, but nevertheless, we will also add some sort of linear actuators uh, to our portfolio, um, but I can't tell you right now um, what they actually will be and look like, but you will see us definitely in more gaming applications and in general peripherals applications. Um, besides that, um, white goods are a pretty, pretty big field for us as well. Uh, which means like all the topics related to guided cooking, uh, the entire cooking experience where the result counts and not how you get there. Uh, let me phrase it that way. Um, another field is for sure industrial and off highway, which means construction vehicles, um, tractors, um, all those kind of goods uh, of vehicles. Um, and besides that, um, there is audio arising, which means premium audio equipment. We just launched a product with uh, Burmester. Um, for all of you who does not know Burmester, it's a German premium audio brand uh, or luxury brand who added uh, the Hapticore 34 to their, um, to their audio uh, systems. And you will definitely see that we will uh, tackle these industries as well um, with a pretty Pretty cool uh, product in mind so far. You uh, you mentioned the the kitchen earlier, and I understand that you cannot share every single insight. But I'm wondering, according to you, what does the kitchen of the future look like? What are the things that are going to jump out? Let's say 10, 20, 50 years. <laughs> I, can, I can share some some pretty cool ideas with you without details. It's more about the res result of the of your of your cooking, not the it's not about like setting your uh, your cooktop to level nine. That's not what it's about. It's more in the kitchen of the future will look like that. You know which kind of uh, which kind of um, products you have in your fridge and what you can cook cook with them and how to explore new uh, new dishes. Uh, how you can make them taste uh, the first time pretty well instead of um, yeah, frustrating uh, cooking experiences. And this is where uh, the HMI counts. You know, There is one thing in the entire white goods which does not work uh, really well, and that's touch screens. Um, not sure how, which, kind of co uh, which kind of cooktop you have at home. But um, for instance, for me, I have a, a cooktop with a touch sensor for adjusting the, the temperature yep. and it works horrible. 
It I'm in a constant special. fight with my Bosch equipment. Uh, right. <laughs> my microwave, you know, like... specific. And... Yeah, they're 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 absolutely terrible. I I, I hate <laughs> yeah, them so much. So they're very durable and nice, <laughs> but yeah, setting the timer not my favorite part in the kitchen. I hate it. Right. <laughs> and you know, like just imagine, even if you add vibro tactile to the cooktop, it doesn't change anything. You know, like. You're getting frustrated anyway, and especially if you think on future things like adding a display in there um, and guided cooking where you are in constant interaction with uh, that damn thing. It's not just turning mm -hmm. it on and off and setting a temperature. No, you need to follow steps. And now just think about how frustrating this the yeah. experience would be if you would need to tackle this uh, damn display all the time. So um, the future of cooking is quite interesting because we really need to have an appropriate HMI there, um, which is clean, um, which is washable, which is movable, um, which gives you the desired feedback for the desired input. And especially with uh, guided cooking coming um, into the kitchen of the future, uh, you will need adaptive haptic feedback in order to have an accurate control in every situation, which means even if you have wet fingers, greasy fingers, dry fingers. I mean, sorry to jump in here. I I I don't like the need version of things in haptics because that's usually not true. <laughs> sorry uh, to say that. It's a really, really hard, uh, hard situation where haptics is needed. Uh, haptics is sometimes is needed. Uh, more often than not, it's cool to have. Right, because you can uh, always click a button even without haptics, right? But the key point is that like in automotive right now, everybody passed with the touch screen, but then right now the European safety agency say, no, but you need buttons to get the, the five stars because that's better. So I wouldn't say it's needed. I would say it's like it's a better experience or a premium experience because even now there are these uh, cooking plates when you have a rotary control, right? Miele has one, right. I think, where you have uh, these uh, really nice... That is magnetic, it's just taking away, yep. clean, put it back. And actually the experience is so much better compared right. to having not having that, right? So just having a rotary control instead of a sliding control without haptics is so much better. So the question is uh, what's the value and what people are ready to pay? So um, I do agree that if some critical situation might be needed. Um, you 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 sh sh discussed about the you know the not not the haptics but the tactile feedback I would say right. the tactile feedback on rotary control for critical operation is needed. Is needed haptics? Maybe maybe there is a reason to put haptics to or decrease value or to increase the capabilities, right? But you still are able to achieve okay, most of that things with um, with mechanical feedback, right? Because otherwise That's people true. would not have had rotary control in the first place. That's so true. I do agree with you that is uh, another value. So so yeah, so I think that's a, I, I think it's I like to point it out because I I no, don't like the words needed, let's say. That you're right from from this perspective. Um I think if I rephrase it, it's needed from a experience point of view, you know. Okay. Because uh, it's not required by law or it's not needed because um because of uh the usability of the system, but it would or it enhances the usability of those systems, especially when it comes to multi-layer menus on a, you know, like multi multi-layered menus on an oven. They're horrible to control. They're crazy horrible to control. So from an user perspective, um, from user experience perspective, they're more than a just nice to have feature. We have. We have done uh, with our customers, we have done some user studies there uh, where you clearly see the benefit of uh, of the of haptic technologies, um, especially in and now you need to to have one thing in mind. Um, the oven is not just controlled by uh, young mid age uh, guys like we are. We're used to touch screens and multi layer menus and whatsoever. No, actually, my mother needs to operate them too. And my mother is 75. And, you know, like if they if she needs a course from her son to get a, to, to switch on an oven and we're on the on the on a bad track, you know, but basically that's what's what's happening right now. If you look at the 
uh, new, like everything is getting, you know, like more function. They're adding more functions for the very uh, same thing, you know, um, selling more attributes, even if there there is not a really, uh, really big difference between the features at all. But it it leads to a con uh, confusion of the customers, at least in in several uh, age groups, where hey mom, sorry if you if you if you hear that, but you're definitely affected by it, uh, you know. <laughs> That's why that's why one of the most uh, one of the most conversations I have with her is related to uh, those kind of HMIs. And this is how I define needed in this case. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So it was a good uh, save uh, saving corner. We see. <laughs> and uh, no, I understand, but I, I, I just tend not to like the first needed attached to haptics if it's really not needed. Um, as uh, I'm deeply convinced that haptics is an experiential added value, and the question is how we can decrease the barrier of adoption um, in, in all direction. I mean, it's needed because if you don't pick up your phone in, in the pocket, then there is haptics and that's a disaster, right? But uh, anything else than that one, it's about or compressing cost, like uh, the simulation of the clicks uh, today, or usually doesn't happen because uh, there is no reason. So, but again, but, you know. There are certain industries like Xiltech is not operating in them, where but there are haptics needed. For instance, steerable yeah, wire sure. system. But if you're oh, okay. driving a car with a steerable wire solution and you don't have haptic feedback, uh, you will be dead. No, like, I agree. There are some spots where you really have to have even force feedback, where it is required by law. Um, if you want to do something like that, um, Xiltech is not active in the automotive industry. That's for a very good reason. Um, to, to point that out, we have a partner um, which is called Signata. It's a uh, former CDF group. Um, who are doing the automotive, uh, yeah, or who are supplying automotive markets uh, with our technologies. That's for a good reason. They're an automotive tier one supplier. They have all these certifications they need um, to have a proper. Uh, to do a, to have a proper automotive project uh, product, and it's not just about the haptic uh, haptic core it itself. It's about the surfaces, about the CAN bus protocols, and everything where you really need to embed um, the the fiber and stuff like that. Um, and this is one of the questions you had before, Eric, about the integration. Um, so this is, for instance, why we have partners in some markets like automotive, industrial, and of highway, but we really have partners who are doing the integration because integrating haptics into a CAN bus um, so that you have the right haptic signal from the in the right situation um, is not that easy actually. So what we do is we partner up or we team up with uh, companies. Okay, so thanks, Philip. I think uh, I'm happy on my side. Brian, do you have any further questions? <laughs> I'm happy too. I wanted to ask you, Philip, uh, before we close off the episode, if people are excited about your work, about Sealtech, where can they find more about you guys? Actually, um, on the homepage, for sure, uh, sealtech.com, um, via our LinkedIn channel. Um, and whenever there are questions about what we do, how we do, um, or how to test our products. Uh, we just released um, our new experience kit, which uh, is well be priced well below 100 uh, euros, um, which is just aiming to get uh, so that everybody can get an impression on what force feedback uh, means. Um, they're available in our online shop as well as all the um, evaluation kits, the EVA, EVA kits. Um, and whenever there are questions, um, just drop us a, mes a message and we're very happy to to answer it as soon as possible. Perfect. You hear it, guys. Make sure to check that out. Philip, thank you very much for being with us today. This is sadly the end of the episode. For everyone that's listening, be sure to check out the hapticsclub.com and follow us on LinkedIn and X. Our blog is now live featuring articles from your favorite hapticians. And if you want some extra haptic swag, Make sure to visit the hapticsclub.com slash shop. We have some cool t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts. You'll find it all there. Uh, and catch all our amazing episodes on YouTube and on every podcast platform. There is pretty much Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can find us there. And last but not least, thank you, Grewis, for sponsoring this episode. 
Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and see you next time. Mm -hmm.